ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. It's my absolute pleasure to be here with you today at Energy Disruptors Unite. Now, of course, nobody likes disruption, and I experienced my fair share. I have to tell you on my journey here, but to avoid the really catastrophic disruption that millions of people are already experiencing and exposed to, from Pakistan to Puerto Rico, the world needs you guys, the world needs energy disruptors to continue supplying the vast amounts of energy to keep the global economy moving without emissions. Now, Eric Ingersoll and I co-founded two pretty disruptive organizations that are leading the work that I want to share with you today. Terrapraxis, the nonprofit, and Synergetic, our development company. Now, both were born out of the realization that a massive reimagination of our energy system is needed to protect our planet and grow human prosperity, particularly for the tough to decarbonize parts of the economy, industrial heat, coal, heavy transport. Now, sometimes we make a joke when we're introducing ourselves on stage, and I say, hi, I'm Urgency, and he, this is scale, because it's kind of our mantra for tackling those tough to decarbonize sectors. We need new strategies to achieve those costs and speed and scale demanded by the climate emergency. So let's see how we're going to bend that emissions curve. Well, first, the bad news. Global carbon emissions continue to rise each year, driven by demand for fossil fuels, despite decades of public and political support for action on climate change and large-scale deployment of renewable energy. At the same time, 13% of the world's population lack access to modern electricity to power their lives, which hurts the health and well-being, particularly of women and children, the most. Millions of people are already exposed to deadly climate impacts and need massive amounts of clean energy to build their resilience and their prosperity. But the further bad news is that if fossil fuels do continue to make up the vast majority of world energy use by mid-century, as we can see in this chart, that's what's projected to happen. All mainstream projections are indicating that will be the case. Then we're on a trajectory to a catastrophic three to four degree trajectory of warming. But here's the good news. We can still achieve net zero by 2050 if innovative climate solutions are pursued at speed and at scale. Now, during the pandemic, we learned that by treating COVID-19 like it was an emergency, we were able to collapse the development of a vaccine which usually takes 10 years to 10 months. Now, we call climate change an emergency. We need to start acting like it's an emergency. We have 27 years to transform our global energy system while doubling or tripling global supply to meet rising global energy demand. And yes, we should electrify as much as possible, but to achieve this transition at the cost and the speed and the scale that's needed and to reduce the risk of failing to decarbonize in time. We need to repurpose as much of our existing infrastructure as possible. We need to repurpose our coal plants and their existing transmission. And through production of drop-in substitute fuels that can be stored and transported and distributed through existing skills and supply chain and capital of the existing oil and gas sector that's already operating at global scale. That will enable us to tackle those remaining tough to decarbonize sectors. So at Synergetic, we're all about deployment architecture. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean new ways of delivering infrastructure to target those high priority sectors for decarbonization, coal and oil and gas, and that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. And how to do that in ways that achieve the cost and the speed and the scale that are relevant both to the scale and the timescales of the climate emergency. So first, repowering coal. Now, coal plants are the single largest source of carbon emissions on the planet, but simply shutting them down, phasing them down, phasing them out, it's not really a viable solution because it would be devastating to the local economies and the utilities that depend on them for energy and jobs and other socioeconomic benefits. It's unrealistic politically, economically, and practically, so even more so now during the current energy crisis. 
there's two terawatts of coal still expected to be generating, operating by 2050. Here you can see all of the coal plants in the world being built. We've delivered a lot of infrastructure over the last several decades, and more than half of the global coal fleet is actually only around 14 years old. There's a trillion dollars of unrecovered capital in that fleet. And carbon emissions from new coal plants just being announced this year in China and India will produce enough carbon emissions to completely wipe out the emission savings in the United States over the last 15 years, the economy that's made the largest overall absolute reduction in emissions um, in 15 years. So it's just not realistic to assume that we're just going to be shutting down those plants. So we need to repower them, but to repower that global fleet between 2025 and 2050 would require an average rate of repowering of almost 100 coal plants per year, 96 coal plants per year. And the problem that we have is, guess what? The current industry and the deployment models that we use to deliver infrastructure today couldn't come close to delivering fast enough and at that scale that's required to meet the growing need. So to address this, our nonprofit, Terra Praxis, is leading a world-class consortium to enable rapid global repowering at scale. We're looking at eliminating 40% of global carbon emissions from energy. This is the largest carbon abatement opportunity that you've ever seen. Save and grow those local jobs and tax revenues, and then actually reuse the, the existing infrastructure and the transmission to deliver abundant zero carbon energy to billions of people. So how are we going to address all of the differences between all of those coal plants and sites and design a building system that can accommodate a range of different advanced heat sources that are being developed and commercialized right now? Well, we're going to need standardization to address those different requirements and a standardized building system that enables us to move away from a bespoke traditional construction project that would usually take hundreds of millions of dollars and years just in planning to develop much more of a design for manufacture and assembly approach, enabled by some key design innovations that you can see highlighted here on this little uh, diagram. So that one thing to call your attention to is seismic isolation that enables the standardization of the reactor building, um, but also the heat transfer and storage system which delinks the new heat island that's replacing the coal boiler at the existing coal plant, enabling the, con the ex continued use of the existing power island at the coal plant. So that will save the project developer, you know, about a billion dollars by being able to reuse the existing coal plant power island, and then just plopping in the new heat island next door, as you can see here. And the thermal energy storage also enables the plant to be a very flexible, dispatchable generator, enabling the plant to be highly profitable and complement renewables in the mix. Now, it's not just in the building systems design that we're seeing, uh, we're developing the innovations to enable the fast, low cost, and repeatable delivery of these new building systems. It's also in the digital infrastructure, what our colleagues at Microsoft like to call the, the uh, industrial metaverse. Now, with our partners at Microsoft and Brydenwood, we're developing a set of digital tools that can standardize the project assessment, physical building system design, regulatory approval processes needed for coal plant owners and investors to rapidly repower the global fleet. So this entire customer journey that you can see mapped out here, from the initial site screening all the way through to project definition, design, construction, and operation will be enabled by new digital infrastructure, reducing costs, reducing timescales from years of work and hundreds of millions of dollars, usually to develop a project, to a process that's affordable, fast, low risk, and repeatable. Now, this vision received a major boost recently through the uh, United States Inflation Reduction Act that's allocated $250 billion in lending ability to the loan program office of the US DOE to repower existing fossil fuel infrastructure with clean energy, including repowering coal plants with nuclear. And beginning in the new year, coal plant owners across the United States will have until the 30th of December 2026 to apply for US federal grants. That's a pretty short window to apply for a really a lot of money. Now, our goal is to accelerate the building of the repowering coal marketplace and expedite US utilities 
through that assessment, design, and regulatory approval process in order to be able to access that LPO funding within those very short three-year window that's available. So as early as this fall, our first Evaluate application was going to be rolled out as a free product for coal plant owners and institutional investors all around the world to begin enabling hundreds of, coal, of gigawatts of coal plants to be evaluated for repowering by the end of this year. And just a couple of weeks ago, we signed a strategic agreement with Microsoft's president and vice chairman, Brad Smith, to develop tools for coal plant owners to repower their plants. Now, we're right in the middle this week of our second Microsoft Hackathon project after winning the Microsoft Sustainability Hackathon last year, and we're really excited that we'll be able to launch this Evaluate tool later on this year. So watch out, uh, watch this space for that coming soon. Now, with Microsoft and with our other partners from MIT, University of Buffalo, Schneider Electric, Bryden Wood, they can help us to accelerate the benefits of repowering that can, we can bring to each community and initiate hundreds of projects simultaneously by leveraging the unparalleled digital capability and the scale of their market presence. It's just the beginning of our shared mission to develop these tools and bring them to market. So come and talk to us if you'd like to get involved. So next, fuels. So remember the chart at the beginning? We saw you know, the vast majority of our energy still coming from fossil fuels by 2050. Coal was a big share but the rest really is oil and gas. Now, it sounds daunting to achieve the scale of the production that's needed, the scalability and the power density that we can bring through advanced heat sources is going to be a major benefit in helping us to address that. And as we saw with repowering coal, by moving to a manufacturing-based model with modular designs, it's possible to deliver hundreds of units in multiple markets around the world each year to produce abundant, clean hydrogen-based synthetic fuels. So next, I'm going to describe two uh, deployment models to bring advanced heat sources cost-effectively and at scale by bringing the uh, factory to the project and then by bringing the project to the factory. So to achieve global market penetration at the speed and the scale required by the climate emergency, these drop-in substitute fuels have to be delivered at prices uh, that can outcompete fossil fuels and at a scale that can displace the 100 million barrels of oil that we currently use each day. So in other words, the hydrogen that's really the key ingredient in the synthetic fuels that will act as drop-in substitute fuels, ammonia, synthetic hydrocarbons, the hydrogen that's the key ingredient in those fuels has to be really, really cheap. And as you can see from this chart, in order to make you know, uh, emissions-free ammonia that's competitive with 10-year you know, average oil prices, for example, the ammonia would need to cost really less than $1.50 a kilogram and ideally down below $1 a kilogram. So that's a very challenging price target that we need to achieve if we're going to deploy these fuels at the 100 million barrels of oil per day kind of scale that we currently consume fossil fuels. So this is the first model. Uh, the Hydrogen Synthetic Fuels Gigafactory. It's a fully integrated facility that manufactures the advanced heat sources and the other needed components that, that are then installed and then operated on the same site. Now, this makes for a really efficient, really low cost and very large scale production of hydrogen and clean synthetic fuels. You'll notice that this is a, you know, a refinery scale uh, facility. It's a 20 gigawatt facility. It's sized to be equivalent to a medium-sized refinery. And this is a really a brand new business model for nuclear energy, which traditionally has operated in the electricity market, constrained by the size of the electricity market, by the need for access to transmission, um, and the need for long-term power purchase agreements. By using the high-density, high-capacity heat and power in a multi-gigawatt facility to make a commodity that you can store, transport, and export to global markets, it deconstrains you in terms of the size of the site, in terms of the location of your site. And you know, this, is, this is producing um, 2 million tons of hydrogen per year 
for less than a dollar a kilogram on a site that's less than four square kilometers. Just to give you a sense of scale, 10 of these uh, gigafactories would supply the whole of the UK's current oil and gas consumption. Now, the hydrogen, of course, can be fed directly into existing gas networks or used for other applications, such as conversion to ammonia. And here, for example, you see a gigafactory that's integrated into an uh, a onshore uh, fleet of uh, ammonia ships. Um, it's incorporating um, many uh, cooling towers that are using the waste heat from the gigafactory for atmospheric carbon removal, enabling the production of synthetic hydrocarbons, which can be used as, for example, Jet A. Um, so next, let's look at the, uh, the other model that we talked about, where we bring the project to the factory. Because if you're really talking about transfer, transforming your delivery of these new energy infrastructures from traditional you know, project-based construction to high-volume manufacturing, then really there's no better option than a uh, high, uh, high quality, high productivity, world-class shipyard, as you can see here in this case, where a facility like this is being, is being made. Um, so this, uh, this is a, a uh, ammonia FPSO, which is incorporating 1.2 gigawatts heat sources, producing ammonia on, on board, and then uh, offloading it here to a uh, to an ammonia bunker. This, of course, can be scaled to a fleet facility. Here we can see a, a fleet of ships producing 200,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day. Seven of these FPSO platforms, each producing 1.2 million tons per year of the world's lowest cost, zero carbon ammonia. This would be equivalent to about 5% of total global ammonia production today. So the tiny footprint and the delivery through this uh, uh, a very you know, high quality, um, highly regulated, highly experienced supply chain is not competing with you know, the renewables agenda. It's really a very complementary strategy. But it, what it does is enables a path for the global oil and gas industry which is an alternative to the two choices that they currently face today, which is business as usual or extinction. It could enable the global oil and gas industry to feasibly become major suppliers of clean liquid fuels. Now, to produce the 100 million barrels of oil per day that we mentioned would be needed, we'd need 10,000 of those ships that I showed you. There's currently 60,000 large ships operating around the world, and 281 world-class shipyards operating at about 50% capacity that could be producing these ships. So there really is supply chain capacity available. If ExxonMobil, for example, wanted to replace the 4 million barrels of oil per day that it currently produces, it would need 334 of these ships. It starts to become feasible. The nuclear industry isn't used to thinking in this scale, but the oil and gas industry is. So we are very interested in the potential for these high capacity factor, high power dense, advanced heat sources to produce clean fuels cost competitively at the scale of oil and gas. These maps are just a fun thought experiment.